Um, so hopefully folks that are interested maybe can, can take on their own projects um, similar to this. So the evolution of an idea. So this is all started, I usually take on a big project every year or every two years. And it's been, uh, one was a board game, one was a hybrid uh, digital physical board game and an LMS. Um, one was using games for learning instead of making my own game. So I tend to, to jump around from different types of game-based learning and gamification uh, every year or so. And, and this was two years ago, I was looking for a new idea. So the first thing I want to consider was a tool. And right now, we have a vast and wide field as far as ed tech tools. Actually, too much, really, sometimes. It's overwhelming. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what tool I chose and why. The design. So, so if you're going to make an escape room, what are the, the facets of an escape room? Why use that for instruction? Uh, how to actually build it? Implementation, how I, the process of, of getting it out there, and finally crunching data, which I think is an, a very important part of the process that a lot of educators that implement technology and innovation sometimes forget, is collecting that data and sharing it out with the rest of us so we can build on it. And again, uh, as Mitch said, if you have questions as I go along, please feel free to shoot them out there. Um, so. Uh, the tool. Um, if I'm making a game, there's a lot of ways to go digital, uh, physical games, and then within digital games, there's 8-bit engines, there's uh, Unity, there's Unreal, if you have programming skills, etc. So um, for when I considered the tool, the big things I was looking for was first the cost, um, because I knew that uh, if the intent was for other teachers to maybe take this tool and emulate and, and do their own projects, it, they weren't going to have a grant or money to use it. So it needed to be something that was cost efficient. Ease of use. Um, I feel the pain of educators when they see these great tools and great games that, that people put together and say, man, I wish I could put that together because we're not programmers. I mean, I don't know who all is here, whether maybe you're a programmer. I'm not talking to for everyone. But in general, the folks that are designing these games for classrooms um, don't have the skills to build the kinds of games that you see on an Xbox, for example, or on Steam. Um, that takes a special skill set. So I was looking for a tool that can build an experience, but was approachable by me, who, who is into ed tech, but is certainly not a programmer and doesn't have any kind of background in that. Distribution, whatever tool I use to make a game, whatever platform the game was on, had to be able to get to the hands of students. Um, now, that, that's gonna depend from, from school to school. Can they use mobile devices that are allowed to use their phones? Do they have Chromebooks, are they one-to-one? -one? Um, do they not have anything and all they have is a computer lab? Um, the tool had to be able to be distributed by as many mediums as possible to allow for it to be to get to the hands of students. If, if it's something like a Unity game, which can only be used through Steam and a desktop, or a VR game for which you need a headset, you've narrowed the field of who can actually make use of the tool. Future ready. So what a tool that I could, I could build on. So yes, I can make this experience, but, but the tool had to be able to make feature experience. So maybe I was, I was building for a desktop now, but maybe the same tool could build for VR later for that day when we all have VR headset in every classroom, which I hope is coming one day. So Amazon Sumerian is the tool that I, that I landed on. And it's, uh, it was very recent back then. It was still on beta when I first came across it late 2017 and started using it more 2018. And one of the many reasons why I used it was the cost. Uh, versus having to pay an upfront cost that was large. It was, it was uh, as you can see here, the way they, that they charge is per use. Uh, six cents per gigabyte per month, uh, and traffic was 38 cents per, giga, per gigabyte per month. And this is the example, the pricing example they have on their website, you can see here. But pretty much, if you have a, a hundred, a hundred uh, kids or a hundred people using your, your experience in a month, um, an experience about a gigabyte in size, it'll cost you about a dollar for this program for that month. I've been using it fairly heavily for this experience and others for over two and a half years, and my total cost for paying for Sumerian has been about $46. Um, and again, I, I don't work for Amazon, they don't give me any kickbacks, I'm just sharing the cost in case you wanna use a tool that, that I believe um, met that criteria of, of being cost friendly. I don't know, Enrique, you know, if you got 10% of the business that you got given them, I mean, for $4, you could buy a whole cup of coffee. Right, not a Starbucks coffee, but you know, a cheaper yeah. coffee. <laughs> so the, the big thing is now that I have a tool, what to build with it. 
so the first thing I did was learn a tool, like, like anything else. I didn't know how to use it. I'm not a programmer, so I spent a long time learning how to, how to do anything with it. It was very friendly. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to know a lot of coding to be able to, to put something together. And they have lots of tutorials. So if you go this route, they, they have very well organized tutorials so you can learn how to, how to make your own experiences. If you'd rather do that, then try to use an existing game. And the Serious Play Conference is where I got the idea. It was that summer, and one of the presenters was talking about breakout uh, boxes. Um, now, I'll talk a little more about breakout boxes, but basically breakout boxes is where you use when you can't put together an escape room, I guess you could, you could say. Um, but the speaker uh, talked about escape rooms, their advantages for use in education, how they work, um, how they entice the learner, entice the learner through uh, curiosity. And I thought it was a great way to approach instruction. Um, so the speaker then want to talk about breakout boxes, which are a way of bringing a, an escape room to your classroom. So um, escape rooms, uh, if you don't have a basic concept of, of what that's like, just, just to make sure that I cover all my bases here. An escape room is, is basically taking a space. It could be your classroom. It could be um, a room in the library. And then setting up a number of puzzles with a theme that students have to solve through the use of some kind of objective, educational objective. That's what makes these, these escape rooms different from the kinds that you go out and you play at the mall. Um, and through the uh, application of instructional content, they solve the puzzles and eventually escape out of the room. That's the basics behind it. And, and one, of the, one of the folks that I worked with on this, on, on, um, on this project, she is a librarian and she built escape rooms in her classroom. Uh, now, the, the, one of the complaints about escape rooms is the materials and the space needed because once it's set up it's set up it takes a while to, to put together once uh, a student or several students complete it you have to put everything back um, and you can't use it for other things in the meantime it, it, it takes up quite a bit of of, um, of landscape to, to get all that put together so a breakout box takes the puzzles from escape room and takes it out of the room puts them in a box and then you can you can have the same kind of experience outside of this of this box that you can rent and breakout edu which is that that link right there breakoutedu.com they they spread out these um uh breakout boxes uh for different objectives and and the puzzles are all themed by the objective so so they're a great company and and uh, through them i learned more about how to design escape rooms um, specific objective. One thing I, I, one of my gripes with a lot of ed tech is that it is educational-ish in that it's maybe addressing some science topics or English topics, but it's not addressing a specific objective needed to be covered in a curriculum. I hope you, you see the difference. Like, like in science, maybe you're talking about robotics, um, but really in, in the high school curriculum of chemistry, earth science, and biology, Robotics, as pertinent as it is to, to, to science, is not an objective that's necessary to cover to finish the curriculum. So I wanted to pick an objective that was, that was part of what a teacher had to cover. So if a teacher used this escape room experience, they would be advancing their students through review or through teaching of, of content that was necessary for them for, for, um, for biology. Uh, and turnkey. I wanted to make an experience that could be used um, uh, uh, out of independent of any anyone else so a, a student that was at home never had the topic could go into the escape room virtual escape room and learn everything they needed about the topic without uh, further facilitation so i wanted to include the material as well as the puzzles that went along with the material um, I, that, that was my challenge can i can i make something that is online and can and can encapsulate completely uh, this this singular objective my objective for, for this project was enzymes. Enzymes is a nice, uh, neat objective in biology. There has several facets to it. You got to understand that, that enzymes have a specific molecular shape, that their shape is, is, um, is vital to their function, uh, that they speed up reactions by lowering activation energy, uh, and they're affected by pH and temperature. They can twist the molecule and make it so they don't work anymore. So these are the basic um, parts of the objective that I wanted to convey through, through the space. And I want to see how I could use the space to help convey the material in a better way. That, that's kind of like my, my approach to, to this project. So uh, the guiding elements for my construction. There is a great, and I have the link here, and I'll share, um, Mitch, I'll give you the link to this Prezi later, and then anyone can get to the, to, to the Prezi and use the links 
to, to click on stuff. Um, but if you click on it, you, you get here, which is um, a great, um, I can't blow that up. Okay, um, a paper about uh, creating educational escape rooms, um, which talks about that framework, which is, a, which is a great tool for making your own escape rooms, by the way. So, so that's, that's there in case anyone wants to use it. But here is their basic framework. Uh, talk, look first, think about the audience, which is so vital. The objectives, like I said, you gotta have a, a specific objective in mind that you're trying to convey. The theme to the escape room, some kind of narrative. Uh, puzzles, of course, are key with clues and hints. Um, and then equipment, how are you gonna put it together? Which in a physical space can be more challenging than when we go to a virtual space. Um, now, the one drawback of this experience, which I knew was, was right off the bat was gonna be one of the downsides of using a virtual escape room, is the collaborate, uh, collaboration, the aspect of having a bunch of users in there at once. This is a single user at a time experience, um, which has advantages and, and disadvantages that I'll, that I'll talk about a little bit, a little bit later. So uh, it's a classic escape room. Now, what I mean by that, I have a video that kind of shows you, let's see, here we go. I don't know if I can move this out of the way. All right, can everyone see the video, Mitch? You can see the video? I don't want to see the video. Oops. Yes. Good. But uh, okay. I don't, hopefully we can even hear it. Good. That would be Just... awesome. Can you hear that? No. Okay. So it's okay. You don't have to have the audio, but if you can see, this is what the, what the space looks like. Um, it's a, it's a virtual space. Uh, they play this on a desktop and there's these keys flying around. Um, so this is the room of keys and it's themed this way because enzymes um, work on something called the lock and key model. They, they unlock molecules and they start reactions and they're specific. Uh, so an enzyme specific shape to, to a molecule. So it's kind of lock and a key in, in that they're specific to each other. So the theme of the room goes with the objective. And that's something that I'm gonna harp on as to talk about design for, for making your own spaces, is especially virtual spaces. Um, try to use the 3D environment to, to uh, convey the message to enhance the experience beyond what you could do with like say a PowerPoint, okay? So. And the slides, do the slides have a link to that? You know, they do have the link to the YouTube. Yeah, so, right here. Okay, very yeah. good. So um, the content was included. So therefore when you go, let's see, 40. I'm gonna scrub through this to get to the parts that I wanna highlight. So the content or the information is included within the experience. So as you can see, once you catch those keys that were flying, you can put them in the locks that match the shape. And that's part of the puzzle. You have a shape and, and they match these, these holes. And when you put them in, the information pops up. And these are the key concepts of the objective kind of um, scaffolded into, into neat little panels. Now this is important because what I did afterwards and what I think it's extremely important for the, for the um, experience to be um, uh, practical for the kids is that if they get stuck with a puzzle later, each puzzle has that same shape that you see on these keys, that you see on these panels. Um, so therefore, if they get stuck in a puzzle, they can come back to the panel and that panel has the content that helps them unlock the puzzle. So they don't have to get frustrated, although they, they still did sometimes, but they can come back and research and, and, and then tackle the puzzle again. So I, may, I wanted to make sure that the kids had all the tools they needed within the environment to, to, to get through the experience, which is why it was here. Plus it makes it independent of having instructions, instructions somewhere else. Now, next I'm gonna show you how the environment, I used the environment to model the concepts. And again, this is an advantage that the 3D environment space has over um, traditional uh, teaching environments. And on all this building that I did, again, I did it with a tool and I'm no programmer. So um, the first one was at 30 seconds. So if you see here at 30 seconds, this is one, this is one of the more difficult concepts and it was a great one. It's a great one to begin with. First, you see that it has two um, icons there, uh, referring back to two panels. So iodine water, and B-Ray solution, these are indicators. And there's a panel that tells the kids that um, indicators uh, work by changing the color of certain molecules. Like iodine makes starches like a dark purple, and the B-Ray solution uh, will make um, proteins like a, like a light blue color, okay? So um, with that in mind, 
um, the kids come here and they, and they can fill up this bat with different colors and keys will come up with different colors. But the connection that they need to make is that on the second panel, on this panel right here, it tells them that enzymes are a type of protein. So by knowing that proteins get turned by Burey, a solution, and that uh, enzymes are a type of protein, they can use that particular vat to get the keys they need for the next puzzle. So they have the key and they can go into the next puzzle and, and solve it with it. So again, on that particular puzzle, they had to use two separate um, concepts that were referenced. Now, one, um, one comment that I got from a couple of, of uh, colleagues that tried it is that they got in and they tried to do it real fast and they couldn't get through it because they couldn't figure it out. And uh, first I took, took that kind of in a negative way, but then I thought about it and, and decided, you know, that's actually not a negative thing. It means that you have to actually apply what you learn and you can't just guess your way through, which I think is important. Um, so the next one is on 54. Okay. So this is my temperature and pH vat. So um, again, I built this within the space and, uh, and I was able to use some really cool features and interactions that it has there to build a vat that affects the enzyme. So this shape here, this circle is my enzyme. As I told you earlier, temperature and pH are key to keep its shape. So the kids can play with the temperature, making it colder and hotter, making the Celsius go up and down or more or less acidic by, by pouring on base, which makes it more basic, or pouring on acid, which makes it more acidic. And as they did, the molecule will change shape. Again, trying to transmit the fact that the shape is affected by these factors. And by, through basically trial and error, they can get the shape to the right, um, the right form. And then the activity tells them, you're right. This is the right temperature and, and pH. You have it at the right place. Uh, you can proceed to the next section. Then they can grab the enzyme and take it to the next activity, which is probably one of my favorite ones, which is this one right here. Okay, so there's this floating shape. This is the enzyme. And once they have the enzyme in the vat matching that shape, they can take it and drop it in. And the next concept that I wanted to convey with this was, and then you'll see how, how I hopefully got the point across with the way this interacts, is that an enzyme um, helps the reaction happen quickly, but it doesn't get consumed. So the same, the same molecule used many, many times without being consumed by the reaction. So as you see, now we, it puts the stair together, which then gets them to the next key for the next puzzle. Again, trying to take these abstract concepts and make them more concrete for the kids and watch them in action. So that's synthesis of molecules by the enzyme. And the enzyme, as you saw, was, was used over and over again, but without being consumed by the reaction. Okay, so let's see if we have 114. Oh. All right. Um, the last one I'll, I'll show you was um, on the graphs, because as you saw there was a graph in one of the, um, in graph in one of the panels, it was uh, activation energy. So I took the graph and I, and I, and I fleshed it out, made it, made it a, a, a three-dimensional structure. And the graph represents how the molecules can't go over um, without, because it takes so much energy for, for the reaction to happen that the molecule can't quite start out. But once you lower the, um, the activation energy, it can actually climb over. And I model that by, by using it almost like a hill. So here, the reaction can't happen because the, the, the little hill is too tall. But once they use the enzyme, the hill lowers, and then that ends, that, that's able to go over and then make a reaction happen, which is making a wall lower so you can get to the next section. So again, trying to take concepts and, and having the kids solve puzzles through learning uh, the concepts and the um, that, that are covered in the objective. Uh, again, I minimize the ability to guess and click your way out. It was important for, for me that, that the escape room be an activity that had to involve some solving. And there was some, some groaning and moaning from the students and that they couldn't just kind of click their way through. They had to actually read and make sense of some of this, which I think is important. Now, the last thing that I want to mention is how it was suitable for many platforms. And this is probably one of my favorite parts about um, Sumerian is so you can see here, that's my son playing with it on uh, uh, the Oculus Go. The Go is one of the lower end VR platforms. It also works on the Quest. But then the same 
activity, there's my daughter playing with it on her mobile device. You see, doing the same things. This experience will work on anything with a browser. So tablet, Mac, desktop, laptop, mobile, and VR devices. Uh, and that's why I liked it. Um, it was, it was uh, it's device agnostic, allowing as wide an SDV cast as possible. Of course, the coolest one is when you use it on VR. Okay, so uh, getting it into the hands of students. So once I had the activity ready, I reached out to a friend of mine that works at Northwest, Northwest Guilford High School here in Guilford County, uh, Greensboro in North Carolina. Her, her name is Natalie Strange. I went to school with her at UNC Asheville. She was a teaching fellow there and she's now um, the librarian at Northwest Guilford. She knew Jessica Tidmore there who is a biology teacher. And uh, I showed them what I had. They actually helped me with the first iterations, gave me lots of comments on what they liked, what they didn't like. Uh, Natalie even let a couple of, of the kids that work in the library uh, do the activity, and that helped me shape the experience a little bit more. Um, it also highlights one of the, one of the uh, weaknesses um, of the project, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so all in all, 143 students, actually 148 did the experience, but only 143 did the pre and the post. So only 143 I included in the results. Mostly ninth grade, um, most already had the content uh, before. So by the time we, we were actually ready to deploy this um, uh, activity on the desktops in the library, the kids had already had enzymes in uh, Jessica's biology class. So they already knew the content coming in. As they said, uh, they did it in desktops in the library, which were fairly old desktops and handled it great, even though the Wi-Fi wasn't great. So luckily the, uh, the experience was very low in size which kept the cost down. Um, I think it cost me $6 that month and also uh, kept, um, kept it working well even under low Wi-Fi conditions. And there's, there's a picture of, of one of the kids playing it in the library. And it was facilitated. And actually this is really, really important because the kids did have questions because it is not a, a lot of folks think the students will, will take to the digital right away and a lot of them will have questions because it's not textbooks and, and worksheets. So being facilitated was actually a great thing. They helped the students kind of figure things out. Plus they collected comments from them that came back to me and let me make some changes on the fly. So uh, results. Um, so this is, this is kind of the meat of, of, um, of what happened. So Dr. Stylianos Mistakaitis um, uh, from Greece. Uh, he is uh, someone, an acquaintance of mine through Rand Heinrichs. And Ran uh, was my professor at the University of Washington, where I got an online degree in virtual worlds. And Stiliano's got his own degree in virtual worlds just a year before. Um, so through Ran, we got to talking, and Stiliano's was working in Europe on distance education and training, and wanted to take my data, uh, collect this data that I had, and put it together uh, into a white paper. So he's working now at the University of Gisvaskia in Finland, um, and Ioannis is a colleague of his, of his from Patras in Greece, where he was working before. And they took the, uh, took the information that I collected and they, and they collated it basically into, into this white paper that I'll share with you in a minute. So the white paper is available. And again, when you have this link, you can get the paper. Here, you can download it. Uh, and I'll email everybody uh, either tomorrow or Monday with all the links. Yeah, um, and this has a lot more detailed information on, on what we did and has a lot of the same pictures. So, so if you're interested in more detail on the, on the math and, and, uh, and some of the concepts, it's in here. So uh, after the experience, we had kids do pre and post questions. So before the, before the uh, virtual experience and after the virtual experience, they answered some questions. And then what we did is look at trends. Now, this is where some of the, some of the weaknesses come in, and you'll see later on in the comments, some of this reflected. But um, I had, this was my first deployment of the, of the experience uh, to any number of students. Before that, I was kind of here and there taking some, some uh, comments and making changes that went along. But really, to have made this effective, I needed to do uh, a beta deployment to a maybe 10, 12 
kids and get their comments, be able to make changes and then deploy to a larger group. Um, because I was making changes as a lot of these folks were, were engaging with the experience, which is kind of building the plane as you fly in it, uh, which I don't recommend. So it did make the experience a little bit different for, for some folks. So looking at the results, uh, like I said, 100, 148 students did this, 143 did both the pre and post test. So the data is mostly in 143, 14 and 60 to 16 years old, uh, about half and half male and female with five folks that did not want to disclose. And 90% uh, of them had already had this in the class. So that's an important, that's an important um, point to make in that they already were taught this material prior to coming into the, um, into the experience, which means that you would, you would imagine that there's very little change to no change because they already know it. Unfortunately, it was what I was faced with because this is the classroom I had available to me uh, and they had already covered the topic. There were seven content evaluation questions uh, about enzymes, pre and post, same questions, and eight method evaluation questions about how they like the experience, how they like learning this way, which was strictly post uh, the experience. Uh, oh, it was sort of served through a Google survey. So results. There was an overall increase in performance between the pre and the post test of about 10, 11%. Uh, two questions uh, improved dramatically after they, uh, they did the, um, the experience, which means that it, it helped them clarify some concepts. One decreased slightly, but that question is you see only a minute. Not a lot of folks got it right. So we think it was a problem with the, with the specific question being confusing, not so much with the, with the room. So what this looks like, they average about 4.28 points the first time around uh, with a median around four out of the seven points. And you see the kind of the trend. And here's after the fact, you see that the, cur that the curve um, skews definitely towards the right to more kids getting, these are, these are how many questions they got right, with more kids getting more questions right um, after, uh, after they finished the post-test, uh, after they finished the experience. The median went up a whole point. So more kids got more questions right after the experience. And here is each question. So you can see two questions, number one and number seven. Uh, which were some of the tougher questions, judging by how many got it right the first time, it significantly increased after they finished the experience. This one question, number six, they didn't get many right even, let's get it right afterwards, which we think has, has to do with, with the question itself. Uh, but overall, um, uh, this experience helped them with a topic which they already knew. So this, this is improving their content knowledge from what it was prior to, uh, prior to the experience because they already had it in class. Subjective results. So this is their, their uh, comments on, on how they like the experience. So you see here, one to five scale, uh, how they like the experience. And we have, how how'd you like the room of keys? A very high average. A lot of them, them enjoyed the experience. Do you feel it helped? Uh, was the game easy to understand? And do you feel like you answered more questions? So this number, 3.03, .03, which is right close to, to the middle ground, um, was because there was some confusion on how the game worked. Originally, I was under the same assumption a lot, of, a lot of other folks do that kids can take to games very easily. And I didn't have any um, instructional or tutorial pieces to the game. I dropped them in and they had to figure things out. And that actually caused a lot of frustration and kids getting fed up with it. So I went back and added these panels that told them, you know, this is how you click, this is what you do, this is the purpose. And that helped it along quite a bit. Uh, but because that that portion of it having to build that and getting the comments to know how to build that took a little bit means that there was a there was a number of these kids that never had that before so they were a bit more frustrated and it may have affected their performance which is what i mean by saying that you, you want to test this out on a on a subset of, of um, students prior to going to full full deployment like i did um, to get better results so that's that's a downfall to to my methodology this time around so do you feel the game could have been used in a classroom to help teach students? 85%. Do you think this game could be used in classroom to help the room for students? 88%. So very positive responses. They enjoyed the experience. They had fun with it. And looking at their comments, you, you see here, I thought it was fun to play. When's the third one coming out? I don't know where they got third one from. I guess this was after one of my iterations, maybe. Uh, they wanted to do another one. This should be done before after students learn about enzymes. So yeah, I think this could have been a lot more powerful if, if we were seeing results from not knowing anything about enzymes to, to after they learned about enzymes for the first time. So, so I think that affected the results quite a bit. 
uh, make it longer and harder. Some kids wanted it to keep going, to have more challenges. Uh, it was simple and had good notes with it. It is also easy learning. Um, although the game is supposed to be fun, it is difficult to figure out the mechanics. And this is, this is one of the reasons why I have to come up with a tutorial prior to the game. Uh, but once you figure it out, the game is pretty easy. Just maybe explain that the game is point and click, which is great feedback. Um, you need to have a teacher in this room that can explain if students need help. So that's important. So definitely having a facilitator is, is uh, necessary, at least for the first time. Okay, so next steps. Um, uh, after I finished, like I said, there was, there was a lot of lessons that I learned through the experience. So, so I'm sorry, is there a question? Oh, I heard a microphone. Um, so one of the downfalls is lack of collaboration, which to be honest, is it's something that I don't know if I want to fix. It's really difficult to assess a group. Um, it, when I saw Natalie using her escape room, I did notice some folks um, participated less. And sometimes there were smaller groups that would, that would tackle certain challenges, but not others. So I think the um, instructional value differed between individuals in this space. So even though I know of the advantages of collaboration, of group work, um, I think I'm gonna keep these experiences individual, at least for now, until I can find a good way to do both group uh, and individual um, combined. Um, the format can be a barrier. So, so uh, again, you have to be careful with how you serve it. Luckily, I was able to do it through their desktops, um, but if it was VR only, then, then they wouldn't be able to do it. And also they need a tutorial. You know, it's the first time they're gonna be doing anything like this, even though it looks like a game and everyone assumes that all kids know how to play all games, they still need some instruction and facilitation. So if you're gonna do it in your own classroom for your own group, um, think about that, especially for the first time. After the first time, I think they'd be able to do this no problem, but at least for the first time, have, have some sort of um, either an individual or a video explaining how to do the process. Exposition. One of my least favorite parts, or my least favorite part of all this, was those, those panes of, of text. Now, they were useful. The kids kind of used it for a review, and they referenced them when they needed to solve a challenge. But I really hated using 2D instruction in a three-dimensional space. Everything else was modeled, and the abstract was made into solid shapes that, that, that had activities. And I would love to be able to turn the expositional portion of that into, into its own interactions. Um, that would be a significant amount of work, but for my next experience, I want to try to implement that, where we don't have uh, these essential, essentially PowerPoint slides stuck onto a three-dimensional space. Uh, integration, um, how to get more teachers to, to use it. Now, one thing I didn't share here was the link to the actual experience. And I think if y'all followed me on how the pricing works, you can appreciate why. Um, since the way it charges is per how much use it is. And if someone takes that link and puts it on Twitter or Facebook, and then I have a thousand people using it, <laughs> that cost is gonna go up significantly. So I use it for a pilot and I used it for um, small groups like I did with, with uh, the Guilford High School, but I can't just post it anywhere. Uh, what I hope to happen is that uh, schools or maybe university like the model and they can themselves post it through their own resources where they don't have to worry about a bunch of users using it and a huge bill, uh, which would be a, a bit of an issue for a, for a single creator like myself. And then Alpha but, and Beta. But Facebook. could it, um, if somebody heard about this, could they contact you and could they use it? Yes. Okay. If, if anyone wants the, the link, I'd be happy to share with them. Just like I said, I just ask that they not take it and, and put it on like social media because then the, the, the number of users could go up significantly, which is where the cost comes right. from. And then just, uh, I, Ron uh, Stuckey had a really interesting question. Based on what you've seen, um, it, would you think that these type of escape rooms or the specific one that, that, that you created, that they would be more valuable as an intro activity? Like, okay, we're going to be learning about so-and-so, but let's do an escape room to get you ready for it. Are they, would you say that they would be best used as the prime instruction or would they be best used afterwards to kind of lock in the information that, that the students had, had already learned? So before, during, or after? The, the I think for use before, you, you'd have to uh, modify your design uh, because I think that the combination of the puzzles on top of not being familiar with information would, would cause significant frustration with the students. 
I think it'll be better as a primary where they're, they're receiving the instruction as they're doing the activities um, or, or after as part of the, the review, even as an assessment. Um, where they have some familiarity with the concept. So when these challenges come up, they can be, they can have aha moments. Oh, I, I uh, recognize that word or recognize that shape. Um, and in that way, it can empower them to solve the puzzles mm -hmm. um, and, and feel accomplishment versus I don't, you know, this is all Greek to me to begin with and get frustrated and maybe, and maybe not, not engage with the, um, with the activity. So kind of like a formative assessment. Might yes. Be, yeah. Might be a good use. I think so. and, um, so as long as I'm on a roll. So other questions that, that, that kind of came up is if you were now going to say, well, I, I've done this once and I want, and now I want to do it about another concept. How long would it take you to create an escape room for your, for another concept now? So uh, that's funny you mentioned that because the next, the next bit I was going to talk about was my second iteration of this space. So this first time, and I don't think I mentioned it took me about, uh, all together from, from thinking I'm going to do escape room in, in Sumerian to I'm deploying at a high school about four or five months. Uh, that's not four or five months of work. That is, you know, an hour here in the evening, a couple hours here in the weekend. And a lot of that was learning how to use the software because prior to this, I hadn't, I hadn't made anything significant. I've been playing with it. I made small things. This was, this was a much, much fuller experience that I had made before. So I was learning a lot of things as I was going along and it was a new platform. Uh, now, if I was going to make the exact same thing, I could probably do it within about six weeks uh, because the other bills were pretty easy. And how many person hours but during those six weeks? Um, I would say uh, put in a good about six hours a week. Uh, so 36, about 40 working hours. So, about, so. A, yeah, about a man week. So if somebody really wanted to do it, they can start it on Monday and maybe finish it on Friday, but it would take quite a while to do yeah, and I'll tell you right now that uh, I'm on the second experience, and now that I know a lot of the tricks and, and tips on how to do this, I'm, I'm making a lot more progress a lot quicker. Um, and I'll, I should also say, by the, by the way, that um, it, the, the uh, significant challenges or hurdles overcome uh, from a traditional escape room from how, how easy it was for the kids to sit down, do the experience, reset, and do it again, or have someone else do it again, which with the other experience that Natalie had, where she had an actual escape room, she could have a group of kids do it on one day, but it would be the next day before she could have another kids, another group of five or six kids do it again because of the setup involved with the, with the physical space. Mm -hmm. Now, the second advantage is that with my second iteration, I hope to do not a single experience. I'm hoping because, because I, I like to punish myself to make a, um, the, the goal is an entire curriculum. So that is, this is a number of interconnected, not a single long experience, but interconnected experiences that, that explore all the topics in biology uh, with a theme and a story. So the, the previous experience was, was kind of an abstract challenge. You're in this room, no reason why, you're trying to get out just because. So now I'm introducing uh, a narrative, characters, uh, which I think are essential parts to game-based learning. It helps to, pr to promote uh, competition. It helps to promote uh, intrinsic motivation to solve these puzzles. So I mean, I'm bringing that in, and then I'm trying. To, I'm trying to design many more experiences connected, many small bite-sized um, uh, goal, objective-based experiences. So then I can also take them individually in case the teacher wants to do one on a particular topic, and they can they can have the kids do that one without doing the whole thing. So it have the flexibility of being uh, a, a a whole experience or being taken in bites and be used only when you need it. That's, that's my goal for the next project. And just, and from the project that you did, are you finding that there are elements that you created? Like um, you had that central place where things were displayed or you must have created the keys or, or found the keys or something. Are there elements that you created which, you'll, which you would then reuse? Yeah, yeah. Uh, luckily it allows you to take things that you built and then upload them to a central cloud area, which you can then download back into other experiences. Um, but uh, also, luckily, it's it's pretty easy to come across uh, cheap digital assets nowadays. So I, right. I, I'm going to try to take the quality up a little bit instead of making simple shapes where I slap on textures. Actually, get some kind of neater, fancier um, uh, 3D objects and bring them in and, and make the experience a little bit up, up a little bit level. Now that I know more, I know how to do some of that. 
um, I'm going to try to, to incorporate it and make it a little bit uh, more slick. Of an yeah, experience. there's a lot of objects that are, there, there's repositories that have free objects. Yeah. 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 And then, Google Poly, yeah. So what do you, well, Google and then also, what is it, StemFab? Yeah. Or, yeah. or something. Uh, it's, it's Sketchfab. Sketchfab has Sketchfab. a bunch. Sketchfab. Right. Tinkercad has some 3D objects. Uh, Turbo Squid, uh, although a lot of them right. cost, Turbo but they're Squid. not a great cost. Yeah. So there's a lot of places to find objects nowadays without having to build them. So I think I can make a, a, a very, not prof I won't say professional, I won't go that far, but mm -hmm. a very nice looking experience. What are the chances, it seems to me 40 hours of work would be a, a, a really big project to give kids, but what are the chances that high school kids could create these interactions themselves as a way of uh, uh, teaching other kids? I think it'd, it'd be a fantastic tool for that. Um, that's one of the complaints that I get from a lot of folks uh, either at game labs and universities like our, our university's game lab or MIT's that are trying to make games for instruction uh, or trying to bring games to the classroom and from high schools that try to bring uh, things like Unity into the classroom so their kids can learn how to make games is the complexity because uh, Unity is not an easy program. Um, this is much easier so they could actually do experiences the only thing that you'd have to figure out is how to do the accounts. It takes an Amazon account to get in. If you have an Amazon account, you can already get in, but then um, you know it'll cost a little bit each month. So you have to use a credit card and put it on there for the fifty cents or six cents or however much it costs you for right, that. But month. if the school bought it, if, if the they school have the had an account, yeah, if, uh, yeah, I don't know about multiple users how that would work, but I'm, I'm thinking you should be able to figure that out with Amazon because they promote education quite a bit. Uh, but it, it's a much better tool point blank much better tool for creating actual experiences the kids can make stuff that can play on their on their phones share with their friends online uh, which is very very difficult to do through unity um, so i think it's a better tool for that uh, to actually put together little games they can play with their friends and then vr you can do vr and ar with uh, with sumerian that's why i like it so much as a, a feature thinking tool that enables you to, to do all those things 2d games 3d games VR, AR, all within one platform. Um, and that's what I have here. It's, it's the HMD, which is the headsets, mobile, tablet, desktop, all those things would work. Um, integrating an LMS would be a nice thing that would probably be the most challenging technically for me. Being able to output the results of those assessments to Canvas or uh, Blackboard or Moodle uh, would be, I think, very useful for teachers. So that's one thing I have to figure out. And then more data gathering. So next time I want to have access to more schools, do a proper alpha, proper beta, and before I put it out there, have a much more solid experience to get hopefully a little bit more solid results. And what subject matter? Learning. What's the subject matter do you think for your? Name? I'm gonna I'm gonna have to stick to biology because that's I'm licensed in science. I've taught earth science, I've taught forensics, I've taught biology, I've taught ast astronomy, but biology is my favorite topic. It makes it a little bit more fun for me, and it's one that gets a lot of attention here in North Carolina because it has a standardized state test. So it makes it, it makes it one that they, they will, you know, they, they're eager to get more tools for. So it makes it easier for me to bring into the school. So that's probably what I'll stick to. Um, so uh, that was it. Here's the-, the, the Oh, it was a the great present. question from uh, Chris Crowell. Yes. Is uh, the way you've designed this or, or the way it could be designed, are, do you, can you allow multiple routes to a solution or do the kids have to, you know, is it always like A, then B, then C? Is it serial? So um, it could be designed to have multiple, I mean, it's all in the logic that you build into it. So like, for example, with the, with that ends, with activity with the indicators, you could have picked up the wrong key. You could have used the, 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 um, the starch indicator to pick up a key that wasn't the correct one. Then you went to the lock and nothing would have happened. Um, so you have to go back and, and pick the correct key. And there were two correct keys actually. Here there was a, there was a light base and then um, I can't remember uh, what the other enzyme was, but there were two keys. Only one key matched the, the uh, molecule on the wall. So because the names like lipose goes with lipase, the names match. Mm -hmm. so, so there were multiple ways to get it wrong, but only one way to get it right. So if you go with multiple ways to get it right, it would increase complexity, but it certainly would make it interesting. It is possible to do. So I guess my, my long-winded way to get to the answer is that yes, it is possible. And from a design aspect, I'm not sure if how, how I'd implement it and still get my, my points across, but it is, very, it is possible to do with the platform, yes. Is there, is there 
more questions on the platform, the design, escape rooms? So, and uh, Chris is saying, and you could add feedback to the various failure states too. Yes. Or yes. maybe you did have feedback. I had, I had, um, I, they, they were able to activate these panels that gave them hints. Also for a while I had a voice that would, that would gonna uh, encourage them and also the voice would give them hints except the desktops in the library didn't have any audio. So my voice was, was a waste of bandwidth so I ended up removing it. So well, you even have if to they, be aware. Yeah. And even if they had audio, if you had, you know, 20 kids using laptops, you're right. Uh, they would have had to have headsets or something. Yeah, that would have been a yeah. cacophony. So you cannot have to think around um, what tool set they have available to them. Uh, but yes, there are ways to implement feedback. Uh, I probably could have done more of it to to decrease that change that that feeling of frustration some of them had. Uh, but overall, they seem to enjoy a little bit of figuring it out on their own. So I'd say moderate the feedback and let them you know let them struggle with it a little bit. Is there any more? Yeah, it was a fun, it was a fun, I was actually enjoyed, enjoyed the build. The tool allowed me to do a lot with it. This is what the tool looks like, by the way. This is all in the browser. It's a browser-based tool. There's no download. Uh, so you do it right on, on your, on Chrome or Firefox. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a whole thing about uh, Sumerian at Serious Play last, uh, last summer. So if I'm repeating this to some of you guys that went there, I apologize. But um, a lot of how I built this was with the tool. So I had to kind of discuss the tool a little bit. Um, is there, let's see, I don't, I don't know if I can look at the questions, but uh, if there, is there any more questions? Uh, so far that, oh, Bron has, uh, let's say, so did they, um, did they have a sense that they, if escaping, like if, when they finished it, do they leave the room or something? Um, yeah. The same way they would in the phys physical room? There was an exit door, and when they finished, they had to lower this wall, blocking the door, the door would open. And there's actually one of the gripes that I got was that it wasn't exciting enough at the end. I didn't have, uh, you know, there wasn't an explosion or, or uh, fireworks or, or anything happening. And they're right. It was a little bit of a, of a, a home, home moment there, kind of anticlimactic when the door opened. And that's because you have to keep the bandwidth uh, down with, this is all working in the browser. So it's kind of, kind of imperative that you keep the experience uh, at a minimum uh, for, for some reasons. but. You really needed an extra something. Brum is right in that I needed to make it a more of a, of a, of a, a better payoff at the end than, yeah, than so the you exit could have, door open. You could have had a party going on in the next room, and they couldn't right? join the party until they finished. And so they finished, and then they could leave the room that they were locked into to join the party. Yes. That, like that. It would have been more good. I, I do have in mind to do something a little bit more exciting for the next iteration. This one was, was a little bit of a dud there at the end. The exit door opened. Uh, things went dark and, and they were kind of saying they're like, is this it? The good thing is they wanted more, right? They wanted to keep going. Right. They want to go to the next room. And I think that's exactly the feeling you want to leave in the kids after this, this essentially an educational experience. They end it and they were like, I want more. So I think from that respect, I think it worked um, wonderfully. They were asking to, to, to keep going, to go through the door. So hopefully we can harvest that to, to get them excited about learning. Right. Or Brian says, or a real party, or you could just have some wine for them, you know, when they think <laughs> they get some wine, right? Well, you know what, whatever helps the experience. I, I am open to, uh, to whatever. So <laughs> this is pretty incredible what you did. Thank you. Thank you. I, I enjoy, it was a lot of work, but, but uh, the kids really enjoyed it. And that's, and, and that was the biggest payoff. They, they seem to really have fun with it. Um, and I hope um, I can inspire some, some other instructors out there to, if not do something like this, do something similar. You know, physical escape rooms or other activities that challenge the kids and, and get them thinking and, and um, problem solving and that sort of thing. So uh, that's, that's, what I, that's what I'm here for, Mitch. That's why I came on board here yeah. is hopefully get, get the word out. So. And speaking of getting the word out, do you have a slide with your contact information? Yeah. Um, so you can... Uh, reach me. Uh, here's my email. My name at Duke.edu. Um, you're welcome to email me there. And, and I'm usually sitting at my desk working on learning modules for the school um, weekdays. So uh, I'll get back to you during the weekdays. And the, on the weekends, it may be a little slower because I'm here home with, with other projects. There's always a project for me. Um, more than happy to help. If you want a copy of the link, um, uh, you're welcome to, to 
send a request. I just ask that you don't post it anywhere uh, public right. or because it, of how it yeah. works. Or it seems to me that if uh, anybody listening is a uh, biology teacher and wants their class next year to try either this or, or 2.0, uh, that they should contact you and volunteer because you probably do want more classes. Yes. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I'd love to get more data and also to, to you know, now that it's built to get other kids to be able to enjoy it and, and, and use it for their own learning. Uh, it may be two years before I finish the 2.0 oh, though, okay. because 2.0 is a lot more uh, challenging. The, the 13 units in biology and this one experience took me quite a bit well with me a few months but hopefully hopefully within a year and a half two years i'll be talking about it serious play with my next iteration yeah yeah no there was, there was an interesting comment because it, you can see how much work you put into it and so for for a classroom teacher to put this much work in it's it's too much um but um but maybe a teacher uh who's teaching a class in game design could have their kids create the create units for um for the classes next year so maybe yeah. it kind of be a uh, cooperative venture and the the kids could be responsible for a good part of the design yeah yeah now it is it, it is achievable within a summer like most of my projects that i did before was was over a summer like when i mm -hmm. adapted them but that's because over the summertime unlike now i had full days to work on stuff right, um, right. back when i was teaching so, so now that, that I have a, the eight to five thing, it's a little bit tougher to find the time to work on things steadily. But um, a, an experience like what I built is, is doable within, uh, within probably six to eight weeks over, over a summer. Well, I um, think you tell the people from Duke that I said it was okay, that they should be giving you a month <laughs> off to be able to work on this. Thanks, Mitch. I'll pass that okay. along. I'll, okay. Hopefully they'll, they'll agree with you, I think. I think Brian <laughs> will agree with me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be more than happy with that. Um, so I hope, I hope uh, you know, it was instructional for folks. I hope it inspired them. Um, and I'm available through my email if, if, uh, if I can be of any help to anyone. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I, I, I learned a lot. I can't wait. I'm going um, to spend some time with Sumerian and, um, and, and see what I can do. Uh, I don't know that I don't have my summers off. <laughs> but um, but maybe I, I can come up with some things over, over a few weekends. It really yeah. looks exciting. Yeah, and what I what I did was very very involved. You can definitely make a smaller, simple, but very instructional experiences in a lot shorter time by not being quite as ambitious as as, uh, as I was. And it will do AR, so you can mm -hmm. make your own uh, bear, to AR bear to uh, to hang out with folks. Uh, I, I, so well, yeah, I know some people who are using. I think it's called Wanda. Uh, yes. W N A O N D A, where they're using the equivalent of three hundred sixty photos and placing augmented reality objects and doing kind of quizzes or challenges for people using Wanda, which is another tool. Very cool. Very cool. So, uh, yeah, well, thank you. Um, and I'll see sure. you at Serious Play. And of course, I'll see you online on Twitter, Facebook, and, and whatever. Sounds so, good. Thanks everyone for coming. Okay. Have a good evening. All right. Thank you. This is Mitch Weisberg signing off for EdChat Interactive. Hope to see you all for our two sessions in March um, and actually, uh, and, and sessions that are gonna be coming up for April as well. Uh, good night everybody or good morning for, the, for those of you who are in Australia. Ciao.